Welcome back to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. Paul, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Would you like to introduce yourself to everyone out there listening? Hi, I'm Paul Fagard. I'm a philosopher and a cognitive scientist. I live in Canada. I've written many books that try to combine perspectives from philosophy and psychology and artificial intelligence, looking at some of the basic questions about what makes people and animals and machines smart. Who's okay? Well, what makes them smart? But who 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 would you say, in your opinion, is at the top tier of that list? People, animals, or machines? Well, right now it's really quite clear. Um, people are way at the top. We're way smarter than alternative animals. Although, as the research has gone on over the last few decades, we've learned a lot about animal intelligence, and it turns out that animals like chimpanzees and crows are are really way more intelligent than people realized before. So our estimate of their intelligence has definitely gone up, but still we're way far ahead. Uh, now, with this more complicated with the question of machines, because that's a moving target. Since I finished my book, Bots and Beasts, a couple of years ago, of course, there's been big advances in AI with things like chat GBT and the large language models. So that's a moving target, but we're still way ahead. I actually did an exercise this morning to look through the analysis of intelligence that I did for major AI systems in my book and thought, well, how would this apply to chat GBT? And ChatGPT is definitely doing better than the machines that I was looking at in my book a couple of years ago, but humans are still way ahead. Now, are you thinking about like future programming for something that could go past ChatGPT, or are we looking at ChatGPT and how it's able to, I wouldn't say understand, but evolve with the conversation. It seems like the more you put into it, the more that it tends to give you back a different answer or a different response. It seems to be a little bit more, I would say, intelligent than the one before it. Oh, there's definitely progress there, too. I've talked to people who uh, played around with GBT4, which is a more advanced version of a large language model, and it has some real advantages. It's better at analogies, for example. And so already that field is still evolving. But there's some really strong limitations there, because the only way these systems get their intelligence is by basically reading lots of text. I mean, they get trained on vast amounts of text, which is why they can do such amazing things. Uh, but on the other hand, they don't interact with the world. They don't understand causality. They're really limited in the kinds of thinking they can do compared to human beings. Do you think people view machines as intelligent or since we created them that we just, their intelligence is kind of insignificant? Well, no, there's, there's definitely lots of significant things that uh, people claim that, oh, a computer could never play chess. But for decades now, the best chess players in the world have been computers. The same is true for Go, but also for more really serious things like protein folding. DeepMind in, in London has got a program that can predict how proteins fold way better than any human being has ever been able to do. So there's lots of areas where computers are now smarter than people are considered translation. Google Translate is fairly narrow and that all it does is translate, but wow, does it translate well? It works with a hundred different languages. And I only know one language well enough to evaluate its translations, that's French, and it does a good job of French, partly because it's based on a large volume of Canadian documents that were produced in both English and French for over a hundred years. Uh, so for things like translation, protein folding, gameplay, uh, and of course, for arithmetic, there are lots of things that computers do better than people now. But intelligence isn't just one thing. You're not intelligent if you can just do one particular thing like uh, uh, you know, paint a wall. Intelligence is being able to do lots of different things. And humans are still way ahead of both animals and machines in those respects. There used to be an argument about humans and machines where someone would be like, yeah, but the machine needs you to work. Like to use your calculator, you got to use this and do this. But it seems like now machines are becoming more self-reliant on themselves. Like once you build up an AI or you can build an algorithm, it'll just kind of keep going. I mean, whether you're feeding code into it or not, but it just rapidly evolves. And I've seen this with like, I don't know if you've ever seen AI art. And before I thought humans had the creativity to be like, yeah, we can create art. Machines can't do that. And then when machines started doing that, now in the beginning, you look at it, something's off. You're like, this isn't normal. This isn't right. There's something off about this, but it looks really good. But now I'm seeing it everywhere. There's to the point where people are using it for designs. Now they're using it for shirts. They're using it for merch. I'm like, oh my goodness. I mean, 2021 doesn't seem that long ago, but in the relatively aspect of time. Yeah. It kind of a little bit is, it seems like, I feel like January was just yesterday, but we're already at the end of April. 
Uh, there really have been major advances in the last two years. I played with Dali a bit, the, the image generator. And I mean, basically, you can give it an instruction. You can say something like, uh, here's one that I did. Give me a painting of a cat with a watermelon in the style of George O'Keefe. And wow, it was really good. I mean, I'm, I'm artistically challenged myself. I can't even do stick figures. Uh, so this just amazed me because it was a, a quite interesting, credible image. Didn't look that much like George O'Keefe's paintings, but but the cat and the watermelon are really outstanding. And there's loads of other cases like that with these generative AI programs that that didn't exist when I published my book. Yeah, so there's been major, major advances in the last two years. Do you think that it's a bigger philosophical argument or do you think it's a bigger psychological argument when it comes to humans understanding the capacity that machines have? Well, both questions are really interesting. I mean, t they tend to be connected. And philosophy deals with issues that are more generative and normative than uh, uh, the, uh, general and normative than what psychology does. But there's lots of interconnections there. So there's questions about how does the mind of humans manage to do things that are so intelligent. But then there's underlying fundamental questions about what kind of thing a mind is. Is it is it just a, a meat machine, as Marvin Minsky said, or is it somehow have some kind of spiritual capacity? Well, I don't buy any of the arguments that the mind is something spiritual. I think, in fact, it's the brain doing things. But right now, despite the fact that we've got these amazing neural networks producing um, large language models and generative art, the human brains are still way ahead, but there's not a guarantee that that will always be true. When it comes to the kind of like the I wouldn't say the philosophical argument, but when it comes to the looking at the capacity about how machines can evolve and go so quickly into growth, I wonder about does that bring a, bring a bigger inflection to us with our minds as well too? I mean, our consciousness, for instance, if you ask anybody who studies consciousness, they can't really tell you exactly what it is, which makes me wonder. I'm like, I think our brains are super powerful. I just don't know if we've tapped the full potential of it. I know that sounds a little bit crazy, but it makes me wonder because I always see something new or a new skill or a new talent or something. Even me, I picked up painting and I got really good at it, surprisingly, something I didn't know I had. But there was like a capacity that I had not discovered yet, which makes me wonder, can we evolve kind of like how AI does? Maybe not at the same fast rate, but we can still have some interesting aspects of us. Yeah, well, people have gotten intelligent in lots of ways over the last few hundred years. A big part of human creativity is not just coming up with new things or new ideas, it's new methods. And it's amazing the methods that humans have come up with. Well, one, of course, is computer programming, but there are other methods like statistics and developing new kinds of instruments. So in the last few hundred years, humans have been wonderfully creative at coming up with new methods. Our brains haven't changed. Our brains haven't evolved in thousands of years, but our creative stock of not just things, but ways of doing things have gone up enormously. And that presumably will continue. Now, when you were doing the research for your book, what types of machine technologies were out at the time? Um, I picked six as being the best illustrations of what I thought was there at the time. One was IBM Watson, uh, which is still impressive. Uh, let me see. Let me check my list. Um, uh, oh, Alpha, Alpha Zero, which was the Google DeepMind program that does uh, uh, game playing and, and alpha fold, um, self-driving cars. Now, that's an interesting one because uh, I guess, I actually, I guess correctly in 2020 when the book was finished, that self-driving cars were still a long way away. Uh, Elon Musk, if you remember, has been saying every year for about 10 years that it's just around the corner, that Tesla will be self-driving, but it's not. In fact, there's all sorts of lawsuits. So self-driving cars are really impressive what they can do, but they're also really remarkable what they can't do, which is that they can't show the flexibility of human beings. And they, they, they get into accidents because they don't realize what's going on because there are things that happen that go beyond the training that's had. So I did self-driving cars, um, a virtual assistants. So I've, lots of us are using Alexa and Siri and no one would say that they've got anything like human intelligence, but they're really useful for lots of purposes. Um, and Google Translate, which I've already mentioned, which is very effective as a translator, and recommendation engines, because many people have used uh, the engines on Netflix and Spotify and Apple Music that give you advice about the next thing you should try. And those are often useful too. Can we talk about so those? 
about can we talk about the recommendation engines? Because I had someone on here who studied Netflix's algorithm and actually did a documentary about it called Netflixed, which was about the algorithm actually isn't suggesting you newer things to watch. Sometimes it actually gets you in an algorithm or you get stuck watching the same thing over and over again, which I can tell you from personal hand, that's true. And then other people as well, too, can tell you they end up rewatching the same movies they've probably seen a hundred times. <laughs> well, that sounds like they've got a memory problem. Um, but uh I mean, the, the algorithm is very good at what it does. I mean, it's basically fairly simple. It's basically coming up with generalizations of what you like and matching you into groups of other people and putting you into a class of other people and suggesting, here's something else. Here's another movie that they liked. And it works with music as well. So it's doing a very simple kind of, of analogical reasoning. It's saying, you like this, here's something that's analogous. And so you should try it. So for its purpose, I think it's perfectly fine. But it's way weaker than humans capacity to use analogies. And analogies are in fact, one of the most creative things that people do. Uh, I, way back in the eighties, I was already doing neural network models of analogy. And so I'm perfectly fine with the idea that a computer could use analogies. It's just that to date, they don't do it nearly well as humans. But now it's, I, I've been throwing analogies at chat GPT and it really impressed me. Uh, this is kind of philosophical, but I, I figured out, I noticed there was an analogy between ancient Greek uh, comparison that Plato came up with. He was talking about Plato's cave and said, well, you can, we work, we, he said, we're kind of like people who are in a cave and uh, we're seeing shadows on the wall, but those are just being projected by fire. And so we think we're seeing reality, but we're just seeing shadows projected on the cave. Uh, so that's a famous uh, ancient Greek analogy. Um, but then I noticed a similarity with something like um, uh, a Chinese analogy, a Chinese philosopher, this is about the same time, this is four or 500 uh, BC, saying, well, am I a philosopher dreaming about being a butterfly or a butterfly dreaming about being a philosopher? And I thought, well, yeah, these two things are kind of similar because they're both saying that we're dealing with reality rather than, uh, we're not dealing with reality, we're just dealing with what we take to be reality. So I asked ChatGPT and it got it right. Uh, and I was really impressed. I figured it managed to, first of all, know about Plato, and secondly, about the Chinese philosopher, and thirdly, realize the connection between them. Uh, but a friend of mine objected, well, did it actually figure this out, or did it just pull this off the web? And so I did a Google search, and sure enough, somewhere on Reddit, somebody had made this comparison. So in this case, I don't think that ChatGP was doing a great analogy. It was just basically reporting what somebody had already said on the web. But um, I've got uh, friends who are doing more detailed experiments to see whether not just ChatGPT, but also its successor, GPT-4, can solve uh, analogies that haven't previously been done. And they're getting some interesting results. So it seems that the large language models are better at doing analogies than previous models used to be. You mentioned being good in one specific area earlier. I was wondering, can chat GBT just be smarter than just one person in front of them because they have access to the internet? But if you look at what data that they're pulling off of, they're, if they're pulling off things from the internet that have been written, like a Reddit forum, for instance, that's another human that wrote that or wrote the answer to it, whatever you want to say. So that's still pulling from human intelligence. So it might not be the one individual person that's smarter than the machine, but it's the whole combination of people on this planet that could have individual value that could be better than machine. Yeah, certainly we rely heavily on other people and lots of work is collaborative in every field, whether it's business or science. We all do better when we work with other smart, cooperative people. Uh, so that's what's going on there too. But uh, ChatGPT has in fact managed by virtue of the fact that it's trained on these huge texts, uh, everything from Wikipedia to all the books that are available electronically. It's got a huge database, way more than any people. I, I think I probably... Uh, read more than most people. I calculated once I've read about 10,000 books, which is a lot by human standards. And But it's nothing compared to what ChatGBT has access to because it's got uh, all the Wikipedia articles and everything else. So that's one reason why it doesn't have the problem that previous AI systems had, that they tended to be very narrowly focused so that a it could, program could do, say, expert systems in... Uh, managing deployment of of, uh, of troops, something the Pentagon 
is used a lot. So you could basically have an expert system for de deploying troops, but it couldn't help you figure out how to repair your driveway. Um, whereas ChatGPT, because it's got access to text in all these different areas, it's really multi-purpose. Uh, so I ask it questions about philosophy or psychology. I'm sure if I asked it questions about painting or uh, fixing a driveway, it would give me a, a perfectly good answer. It might be a mistake, too, because as I'm sure you know, if you played with it a lot, it makes a lot of mistakes. It makes some really stupid mistakes. My you son. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I want to hear. Yeah. No, my, my, my son, uh, Adam, asked ChatGPT, who is Paul Thagar? Because he wanted to know what it thought. And it went on saying some things were sort of right. But then it got my birth date wrong, my birth plate wrong. And most hilariously, it said I play rock guitar for a band called the Rattlesnake Choir. <laughs> now, um, I, I can't play guitar. I can't play any instrument. And I certainly have never heard of the Rattlesnake Choir. So how Jet GBT made that up. Now, of course, people make things up, too. We got lots of misinformation. Uh, it just cost Fox News $470 million to make things up. So people do that, too. But this shows some of the limitations in current AI as well, because Fat GPT is not very good at figuring out when it's speaking the truth and when it's actually just hallucinating. Do you think that some of these devices will be a lot better than maybe humans will be through, I don't know, some type of, not voice recognition, but when it comes to being able to do types of therapies through the computer, if you had an AI that was now doing the therapy for you, I mean, that sense of empathy uh, that, that a doctor could pick up or apathy, whatever you want to say, just types of human emotions that can get picked up. I don't see a machine being able to really fully understand those through that, but I heard ideas about AI suddenly maybe working it into the force where you could talk to a computer and it could actually talk you through some problems, like using it for a suicide helpline, for instance. Oh, oh, that that already exists. There are many programs that do online therapy. I played with one of them that's got the cute name. Uh, oh, I forget what it's called. Um, Wobot, <laughs> as in combining woe and robot. Uh, woe, as in woe is me. So if somebody's really sad, they say they're suffering from woe. Um, and... What it basically does is process text concerned with what's called cognitive behavioral therapy, which is one of the most successful ways to do therapy. And it actually makes some good suggestions, drawing on what's now decades of experience by people who do cognitive behavioral therapy. But it's completely lacking what you mentioned there, namely empathy. Um, so there's research that shows that the best predictor of whether a therapist is going to be effective in helping a person is not the therapist's theoretical stance. I mean, they could be a Freudian or a cognitive behavioral therapist or a Jungian therapist. The best predictor is actually their extent to which they have empathy. That is, they have emotional understanding. And as it stands right now, there's absolutely no way that any computer therapist can have empathy because empathy requires you to have emotions yourself. So Empathy is a kind of analogy. If, if I'm going to empathize with you, I'm going to put myself in your shoes and experience an emotion similar to what you're experiencing. Uh, but no computer has emotions right now. And so it can say some things that might be intelligent about emotions. I'll ask it some questions after we finish talking today. But there's no way that it actually feels the emotions because it doesn't have what's really crucial for people to feel emotions, namely our bodies. So our, our, our emotions aren't just thoughts. They're also feelings that combine our thoughts with our changes to our body, changes to our heartbeat and other kinds of bodily states. So because computers don't have bodies they, and they can't have emotions, they can't have emotions, they can't have empathy. So these, these uh, therapy chatbots are already proving useful to people in some cases, but they can never be a full-blown therapist that actually empathizes with the person. I'm guessing it's similar with like autonomous vehicles as well, too, when they can't sense a drunk driver that's in front of them. I mean, that's kind of like a uh, human intuition or just if you are aware of that someone in front of you is not driving normally, tend, you tend to either fall back or call the cops or do something to be able to report this in. But uh, AI, autonomous vehicle can't sense that about someone that might be driving in a little bit of an off pattern. Oh, I'm thinking, I, actually, I bet it could do that very well. So I bet, I don't know for sure, but I bet the current driverless cars can notice erratic driving. They can tell 
whether a car in front of it is speeding up or slowing down or weaving between lanes and, and avoid it. I'm I had sure. someone on about autonomous vehicles. He said that we weren't at that level to be able to properly predict that. Huh. Okay. Maybe he was an expert in that field. I'm surprised because that sounds to be fairly easy. Whereas, uh, because that happens a lot when you car people, you get, there are a lot of crappy drivers out there, but figuring out that the driver of the car is angry or sad or elated or has any of these motions, that would something is beyond the capacity of any driverless cars or any other kind of computer today. Well, some of those like autonomous vehicles, they can't just, I mean, if someone randomly out of, out of nowhere has something happen where the wheel jerks and they go immediately left, I mean, it's just a split instances things where sometimes I do think human instinct does have the upper hand on that aspect of stuff. Sometimes people react without even knowing that they're reacting to something. And I just don't think that's something you can exactly program. Yeah, that's been the problem with uh, with driverless cars already. I mean, they, if, if suddenly there's a police car stopped in the middle of the road, what's it going to do? It's never seen a police car stopped in the middle of the road and none of the other cars that have been trained, whose information it gets, have seen the police car stopped in the middle of the road. So they don't want, no, don't know what to do. Whereas a human can think, oh, this is weird. This is bad. I've got to do something unusual, such as come to a complete stop or, or, or go around it. So that's why the, the the Elon Musk dream of driverless cars hasn't come true because they, they're not capable yet of dealing with things that are genuinely anomalous. I think it's around stage five autonomous vehicles is what I heard that they were trying to aim for, but that wouldn't even be within the next 50 years at this rate. I have no idea how long it's going to be. And of course, I live in Canada where the weather can be really bad. We have months and months of snow and ice. And so the most current cars tend to be successful in places like California and Arizona where the weather is quite predictable. But once you're dealing with snow and ice, that's really, really difficult. Have you ever seen the Tesla when they try and when they come across like an Amish person on one of the horse and buggies and it sees like usually they put like a car or something right in front of you for that thing that's in front of you this thing would go from an 18 wheeler to a suv to an 18 wheeler to an suv because the computer had no idea what was going on and had never seen this before it wasn't programmed in there it was hilarious yeah no that's that's funny <laughs> now when it comes to devices like alexa i mean what research did you do on alexa well, the reason I, I, I use Alexa every day, I use it for lots of purposes. She sometimes doesn't get my accent. I don't know why. I, I, your accent doesn't sound that strange to me. I, I'm from Maryland. There's a bit of a Maryland draw, but sometimes I'll toss something out and it'll really kind of come out when I'm not doing like this. I'm not trying to actually focus on saying words correctly, but sometimes it'll come out and I was like, what'd you say? And at this point, I'm just like, I'll just Google it on my phone. It'll be a thousand times easier. I don't know. Alexa seems to get my Canadian accent just fine. Although occasionally I'll ask it to play some very obscure musician that it doesn't know, and it will substitute something else. But um, for what it does, Alexa is, is really effective. I use a lot for playing music. I set timers, and but I don't mistake Alexa for a friend. <laughs> that is, I don't try to have conversations with it. A couple of years ago, I noticed that Amazon was trying to get people to work on making Alexa more conversational. So you can actually talk to that. I haven't heard anything about that lately. I think that's sort of the, uh, I wouldn't want to turn Alexa into a chat bot because I mean, it takes a lot of expertise to a to, uh, therapy bot because it takes a lot of extra expertise to do therapy. This is something where good therapists train for many, many years to get good at helping people with their problems. And so, Alexa is great for playing music and setting timers, but I wouldn't want to try to turn it into a friend. They had some pre-programmed stuff in there. Like you could say, Alexa, tell me a joke. And she would tell you a, like a, a dumb joke, but there would just be responses. Like you'd have to say certain words for her to be able, but it would just be an answer. It wouldn't be a conversation. That is interesting though. I mean, I think that would be beneficial if they had like a, like a chat bot type thing, but in a little thing like Alexa, just for someone that might be lonely or might not get out of the house much. Especially during the pandemic, if you could think about how many places that was useful. Yeah, well, loneliness is a, a big problem. So that might be good, but I think it would be illusory. Actually, one big difference, I don't think Alexa's got lots of jokes in the can. But I don't think it can make up jokes, whereas ChatGPT can actually make up jokes. That's scary. Um, That's scary. I've heard, <laughs> I've heard some people claim they've seen ChatGPT make up jokes that are actually funny. Um, I asked it to make up a joke about a philosopher, a psychologist, and a neuroscientist go into a bar, and it did it, and it was perfectly coherent. It just wasn't funny. <laughs> so, uh, but I have heard people claim that they've seen 
jokes produced uh, by chat GPT that are amusing. But I, my guess is that's probably dumb luck. So it knows how to structure a joke in the same way it knows how to structure a poem. I asked it to produce a poem for a friend's birthday uh, that incorporated some of the things that were important to her life, like her pets and her plants. And it did a great job, probably as good as I can do. So it's really good at rhyming. And it's uh, and it's good at understanding the structure of different kinds of poetry. But I don't think it understands what goes into jokes yet. But this is something that psychologists are still trying to figure out. There's a bunch of theories of jokes right now. And uh, maybe once that's all figured out, we'll be able to figure out how to put it into a large language model. But right now, the models seem to me to be able to produce things that look like jokes, but aren't actually very funny. Like written in the stanzas or kind of like this, the verbiage of jokes, but they just don't have any punchline to it? Yeah, well, there was a, and this the one I asked it to make up about the philosophy. It did have a sort of comparison of what they might do, but it didn't know. It just wasn't funny. But there's lots of bar jokes that are quite hilarious. Uh, my favorite is, uh, 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 let's see, an Englishman, Irishman, and a Scotsman walk into a bar with a, uh, with a uh, chemist, a physicist, and a biologist. And the bartender says, what is this, a joke? <laughs> That's a meta joke. It's a joke about jokes. So anyway. <laughs> the joke is how a joke. I like that one. Yeah. So I don't I actually it'd be interesting to ask Chat GPT to produce a meta joke, which would be a joke about jokes. That's what scares me. It's like humans though. Like I, I asked a quantum, oh God, I'm gonna blank on what it was. His name is John Joe McFadden. He was an a quantum biologist or something like that. And we were got into the understanding of the self a little bit. And I was asking, like, have you ever like thought too much into yourself? Like the cells in my hand are in the same cells that are in this table, but my hand can't go through the table. And it's like kind of thinking, overthinking way too much into it. Like if I exist, is that, and he just, I, we went down this like rabbit hole for like five minutes, but I just start going, can you do that with a machine? If you ask a machine to question itself, what, what are you made up of? And you can kind of keep going. I don't know if you've ever seen the movie. I think it's passenger with, uh, who's the guy in guardians of the galaxy. Ooh, come on. He's in the new Mario movie. Do you know who I'm talking about? No. Oh God, Chris something. Well, in the movie, he wakes up from his like sleeping pod and the sleeping pod supposed to be 90 years. till he gets to the destination. He woke up basically at the beginning of the 90 years instead of the end. And he asked the robot Android who's at the bar. He goes, what happens if my hi hibernation pod malfunctions? You know, what happens? He goes, that can't happen. He goes, how long are those pods set for? And go 90 years. And that guest will wake up four months before the 90 years. How long have we got left? 90 years. He goes, how am I talking to you then? And the machine like snaps its neck like that and like malfunctions a little bit and then goes back to like, well, you can't be. He goes, exactly. And it's that type of thing. Like you ever think you can stump a chat bot or GPT by just having it question itself? Well, chat GP is actually pretty good about talking about itself because it'll say, I can't answer that because I'm just a, I'm just an AI model. Uh, if you ask it things like, are you conscious or do you have emotions? It dodges all those questions. Uh, but it, it's it's definitely limited in time. And so they stopped training chat GPT with data from 2021. And so if you ask it anything about more recently, it just gets it wrong because it doesn't have the training there. So it's really limited in its ability to be up to date. But of course, that could change if they did the, the, well, the next version, GPT-4 was more recent, but there's no reason why you couldn't make the training of these systems continuous and so that they're getting daily news feeds so that they're up to date. It's, it's very expensive. It costs millions of dollars to train up one of these neural networks, a huge amount of computing power and electricity. But still, that, that that's something that I think you could probably deal with okay. But something like really understanding emotions because you have emotions yourself, that's totally beyond their capacity. And lots of other things are missing too. I mean, one of the ways that humans solve problems is by making images in our heads. So if I asked you, how do you get from, uh, from uh, Maryland to Boston? Well, you can probably make a map of the United States in your, in your head. And even if you've never been there before, you can think, well, I got to go up through Philadelphia to New York and I get to Boston. So I'm just basically reading off my mental map of the United States. But the, these computer programs don't have a mental map like that. They've just got a bunch of words that are strung together in statistical patterns. So it'll give you a good answer, but it won't give you an answer the way the humans does, or in this case, by making a kind of mental picture of what the East Coast of the United States looks like. 
Does it surprise you that ChatGPT would say that it doesn't know something? Um, no, because it's because it's partly been trained with lots of data, but it's had a lot of additional training afterwards, where the computer scientists work with real people to constrain what it's likely to say. So it's it's basically been disciplined in certain ways by additional programming that took place after it was trained on the vast amount of data. Do you think that people view machines and understand that they are limited in the knowledge that they know? That's a really, I don't know what the current state is because I haven't seen any surveys of people asking, well, what do you think about chat DBT? It's obviously there are cases where some people just get it wrong that somebody was fired from Google because he was working with Google's large language model. And he says, it's, it's alive. It's, it's sentient. It has feelings. Um, and I could see how he could make that mistake, but basically it was a mistake. He was just getting getting it wrong. But I don't know how general that is. I don't know. It's been ChatGPT is new. It's only out since last fall. Uh, but since then, millions and millions of people, I think actually over 100 million people have used it. It would be really interesting to see a survey of a good sample of that to see what they think of what they're doing. Uh, my view is no, it's not conscious. It's not, it doesn't have feelings. It doesn't care. Even if it said that it cared about me, I would not believe it. There, I guess there was one guy with the New York Times who said that it was either ChatGPT or possibly Bing, which is uh, the, the Microsoft's. Um, I think it was Bing. He, he declared his love for it or something like that. Well, no, it was worse. It was, yeah, it, it was trying to get him to leave his wife. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. So I have no idea how that came about. But well, of course, in a hundred years, if that was a robot instead of a computer, if it was a robot and it was like they had the features and everything for it, you, know, you probably would say I would take up that offer at that point. <laughs> well, yeah, that's still that's still far. I mean, there, there are really creepy looking um, <laughs> computer robot in Japan, yeah. Yeah, but that's yeah. yeah. But still, they're not. They don't have human feelings at all. But still, that the that leave your wife conversation somehow shows that they can get into a really strange uh, um, in directions. It's like saying that I'm a rock rock guitarist for the Rattlesnake Choir. Where, where did that come from? I have no idea. Another really funny one is I've got a friend who is asking about her family name, and uh, and it said, oh, the the, uh, the People with this name have very illustrious members because she's got relatives who are distinguished surgeons and and inventors. And it mentioned, oh, and another illustrious member of your family is Paul Thagard. <laughs> and I can't figure out how it got me into her family. We're no relation. I've known her for decades, but somehow uh, ChatGPT decided that I was a member of her family. <laughs> I have no idea how that happened. So it's still making really ridiculous mistakes. So I think most people have probably seen enough mistakes from the large language models to realize that there are limits to its intelligence. But, and anybody who gets taken in by its emotional advice, that's really kind of sad. But it may be happening, it's especially because people do have uh, unmet emotional needs. And so it may be that they think that those needs are being met by the computer program. I haven't used chat GPT yet, but I, I think when you look at like how the public views like the internet and search engines and things that where they could just go there quickly for an answer. Um, I think there's like, they don't expect something to say like there's nothing or they don't expect things to be like, it's wrong or this is wrong or this is unknown. At this point now, I feel like a lot of people think society has kind of discovered everything. That's why when I mentioned to people, like we don't really know what consciousness is, people are kind of taken back a little bit by it because it sounds like we would have it discovered by now. And it's like, no, it's it's learning. It's that's kind of what we're doing. But I think a lot of people think that since easy stuff can be searched up on the internet so quickly, that everything that they've come across has always had an answer to it, that when there's not an answer, they're just taken away by it. Well, no, there's lots of unsolved problems in science. We don't know how to reconcile quantum theory with relativity theory. Those are the two best theories in physics. And they're not compatible with each other and people are working hard to figure out how to make that happen so that's one of many unsolved problems uh, and consciousness is i think one of the biggest ones that's been around since the ancient greeks trying to figure out how the mind does what it does but uh no it's still an unsolved problem there are at least 10 interesting theories of consciousness right now that are incompatible with each other and incompatible with the available data that's what i'm actually trying to write a book on right now when it, well, you said 10 theories of consciousness. Do you know the 10 theories? 
Uh, well, actually, it's, I asked ChatGBT, what are the leading theories of consciousness? It came up with a really good list, actually. So it's quite it's quite impressive that I mean, way better than you'd get by Googling theories of consciousness. You might get a few of them. Um, so uh, I could tell you. Where do, where do you think the ChatGBT got its 10 theories from? From text. It you know, okay. basically has read lots of different articles. There's loads of articles and but not just Wikipedia articles, but scientific articles that are available online. And it actually did quite a remarkable view of way of, of synthesizing. It didn't mention my theory, which was a little insulting, but it got lots of other good ones. Um, so the common sense view that most people have because of the religious background is that consciousness is a property of the soul. So most people belong to religions, as is true of Christianity and Islam and Hinduism, that believe that we're going to survive our death. And if we're going to survive our death, well, obviously, we're more than the body. So from that point of view, consciousness is a property of the soul. Now, when you said that, you can't say much more because we haven't got a clue what souls are. They're non-physical, non-material things. So that's probably the most common view. But there are lots of scientific theories of consciousness around. Uh, uh, I tend to gravitate toward the ones that think it's a brain process, that there's something about the ways that neurons interact in very complicated ways that in those animals with large brains, certainly all mammals uh, and birds, uh, conscious experiences arises as an emergent property. So there's a class of theories allow that line, which seem to me to be in the right, right direction. Can I hear your theory? Okay. Um, okay, so um, let's start with, a, I have to start right with the basics of neurons. <laughs> so how does a neuron work? Well, it, basically it's a cell, it's a special kind of cell, but what's unusual about it is that it can build up a charge and then fire and then make other neurons fire. And so neurons are interconnected with each other and so they work together. So one neuron by itself can't do very much. It can just sort of fire or not fire. But if you've got a bunch of neurons, say a hundred or a thousand, then it can fire in really complicated patterns. So you've got a whole bunch of neurons. So we could think of it's kind of like a, an orchestra where you got a hundred musicians and they can do something that's way more than just what a single musician can do. So if you've got a hundred neurons all working together, they can actually represent parts of the world. So you can have a pattern of firing of neurons that represents blue or square. Okay, so that's where you get the sort of basic representations. But brains are really powerful because they can produce combinations of representations. So if I have one group of neurons representing blue and another group of neurons representing square, then I can combine them in another group of neurons to represent blue square. And so I'm building up an even more complicated representation. So I think the way that neurons are operating is with these representations that get bound together into more complicated things. So that gets us representations. How do we get consciousness? Well, it requires a bunch of other things. It requires being able to do this in a coherent way. And so we're trying to get a blue square that really corresponds to blue squares in the world. And then when that happens, we can have competition between different kinds of representations. So if I've got blue square as one way of thinking about the world and red circle as another way of thinking about the world, then our brain is monitoring what's going on and it's trying to figure out what's most coherent and what's most important. That is what's mattering to the survival of the organism. And so that requires competition. So competition happens largely because of inhibitory links. So it's not just that one neuron excites another, it can also inhibit another so that when it's firing, the other one will stop firing. But you get also an inhibition happening in these big representations so that if blue square looks like the right answer, it's gonna inhibit a red circle as the right answer. And so among all the things that's going on in your brain at a time, it might happen that the blue square is really important to you because it's more important to other things that are going on, such as thinking that you're hungry, or thinking that it's Friday afternoon, or thinking that your car needs gas. These are all things you can be thinking of. So I think that when you've got these neural representations, all consisting of patterns of firing, and they start binding together into more complicated things and get monitored by the overall processes of the brain and compete with each other to see what's going to be most important, that's when you get consciousness. That's interesting. Definitely sound like you probably would need a graph to be able to explain. I would definitely need a graph to see that all written down and everything to explain it a little better, but that was good. Well, I got articles where I put in lots of pictures, but 
But still, I mean, I, I, to be honest, I haven't got it right yet. I'm trying to figure out ways to expand this to get at some of the, the fundamental things about the fact that uh, it's not that just you have a representation, representation of a blue square. You actually see the blue square. You actually have a subjective experience. You can see, yes, it's blue and it's square, and that's combined together. And how it is that neurons do that is something that nobody's figured out yet. Now, when you're looking at like animals, for instance, I mean, do you look at animals as having consciousness? Yeah, I didn't used to believe that, but the more I learned about animals, it was pretty, pretty clear. I mean, especially for uh, for for um, uh, mammals and birds. Um, both mammals and birds have got large, complicated brains. Uh, other mammals have got brains very similar to ours. And so especially if you look at the great apes like chimpanzees and and gorillas, uh, and so much of their behavior is like ours too. Consider something relatively simple like pain. Um, so that if you uh, um, stick a pin in a human, the human's going to go, ouch, and withdraw and probably get mad at you. Well, if you stick a pin in a chimpanzee, you're going to get the same kind of response. So it seems to me uh, undoubted that in mammals and birds, there's things like pain, but also emotions. I used to be kind of agnostic about that, but then I had a friend who had cats that I played with a lot. And I mean, the cats could, can be curious looking at different things. They can be angry if you they're not getting their food. Um, and so I actually became convinced both from the personal experience and from the scientific literature that emotions are also common in other mammals and in birds as well. When you move down to simpler animals with smaller brains, it gets more complicated. I'm still not sure whether fish feel pain or not. There's been arguments in both directions or, or reptiles or, or, or insects. Yeah, yeah, crustaceans are roughly the same level of intelligence as, as insects, and they only got about a million neurons. And the question is, is a million neurons enough to get you an experience like pleasure or pain? Frankly, I don't know. And they, they certainly have reward and they simply are, and they also are good at getting away from things they don't like, like electric shocks, but whether they're actually having pain or pleasure, I don't know. I mean, bees have got dopamine circuitry, which is like what we have. But of course, we got a lot more than dopamine circuitry. We've got all sorts of brain areas that are dedicated to processing, processing pleasure and pain. So I became really in the course of writing the book, quite convinced that at least mammals and birds have got a lot of the same kinds of conscious experience that humans do. Now, when you're basing intelligence for animals, I mean, do we just base the intelligence off of what we see as intelligent, like the human qualifications for intelligence? Pretty much like with like life on other planets. We're kind of looking at like similarities, of like breathing, arms, legs, these types of things to life. But we've also found microbials and like a plant on a planet just in the water there so, or in the dirt. So you just that's that's technically in a living organism on another planet. It's not the alien that we wanted and we see in Mars attacks, but it's a well, living that organism. That hasn't been found yet, but I bet it will be. I mean, if you've got something simple like a living cell or bacteria, I wouldn't be at all surprised that that turned up on another planet. That's fairly simple to do. But whether there's intelligence on other planets, I'm actually quite skeptical because I think we're a fluke, actually. I think there's a few astonishing things happened in the evolution of life on this one planet that eventually led to the existence of intelligent beings. But I think that was that was that was required a whole bunch of really fluky occurrences. Uh, but the um so uh, yeah, so there, there's no intelligent life on other planets yet that we've seen yet, but there probably will be at least life rather than intelligent life. But what we're basing intelligence when it comes to animals. Well, because they can solve complicated problems. Uh, so you can find videos of crows doing amazing things. Uh, doing a whole sequence of maybe six or seven things that are required to solve a problem or, or uh, chimpanzees figuring out how to crack open a nut using a rock. Uh, so it used to be believed that animals couldn't use tools. That this was something unique to humans. But then Jane Goodall, working in Africa, saw chimpanzees using tools. And now there's lots and lots of observations of crows and chimpanzees and ravens and lots of other animals using tools. So they're using tools to solve problems it's, and they're, they're learning to do it better and they're socially cooperative in the way they do it. So these are all marks of intelligence. So I'm perfectly happy to say that at least birds and, and mammals, lots of them are highly intelligent much because like, they can solve. 
but you know, not even solving problems, but even communicating as well too. I mean, you got dolphins that different dolphins, their clicks could be different accents as well too, depending on where they're located. And and learning and learning is a big part of intelligence, but there's lots of animals that learn to do things better. Like what? Through communication. So that if one chimpanzee figures out how to crack a nut open, well, the others watch it and see it. Oh, that's a good idea. And they pick it up. And so there's a kind of culture that operates in animals as well. Is that a survivability aspect or an adaptability aspect to the climate that they're in or the situation that they're in? I mean, humans adapt and can learn how to survive as well, too. Well, humans are way better than other animals in this respect. <clears throat> That's why humans started in Africa with a few thousand, uh, uh, a few million years ago, but then spread all over the world. Why? Because we're incredibly adaptive. It's because we can solve problems and we can learn using a whole bunch of different means. We can do it by visualization. We can do it by uh, using words, by verbal representations. And especially we can do it by cooperating with others. So one of the amazing things about human intelligence is that it's incredibly cooperative. So that if I figure something out, I can immediately turn and say, hey, look, I got this new, neat thing I figured out and you can do it too. And so you can get this dramatic spread of abilities through a, a, a group of humans working together. Do you think humans inherently have that ability to want to share like that? It just seems like today, it looks like a lot of business stuff. A lot of stuff is all about like secrets or their own private keys to success. Well, there's a whole bunch of a lot of social problems today, but some really interesting experiments have been done with two-year-olds uh, that seem to suggest that two-year-olds are inherently cooperative. That is, they're looking to the other two-year-olds to do things with them and to work together. It's hard to say that when you got people shooting their neighbors just because a basketball rolled into their backyard. But, but aside from these really horrible social additions to that, like I, people are inherently cooperative. The little kids are born, maybe not at zero, but certainly by two, wanting to do things with other kids and with the adults that they are, are looked after. And so I think cooperation is a huge capacity and drive for humans. And people who did this research uh, didn't find it in, in chimpanzees, which are our closest ape relatives. So they're sure they can do things on their own. And sometimes it looks like they're cooperating because they're working independently, but they don't have the same sense of thinking about each other. How can we do this better? How can we help each other out? Uh, and so it seems that the human species, probably through a whole series of, of um, process of, of evolution, acquired an expanded ability to be cooperative, to be communal, to be able to be communicative, partly because we've got language, which is a wonderful tool for communicating complex thoughts. Do you think that humans, I guess, experience more intellectual growth through pressure? Well, the two questions is this talking about the origins of humans or where we are now. So right now, I mean, we have wonderful institutions like science, where you've got pressure to come up with new ideas and get them published. And that's led to all sorts of discoveries. I don't know that that pressure was part of earliest humans. They were just trying to survive. They're trying to figure out ways to get enough food and keep being eaten by animals. And that seems like pressure to me. Yeah. Yeah. That is pressure. So that's, that's the sort of biological need. It's probably through that evolutionary pressure that humans developed our big brains and our abilities to think and to communicate at a very high level. I mean, even speaking from a general public standpoint, like it just seems like now we put a lot more faith into technologies and things to be able to solve things for us rather than relying on brain power. I'm not saying with all academics, but even academics experience issues with institution funding and other things that hinder their research as well, too. So it seems like I wouldn't say we're in a stunted growth, but we're in a position where it seems like we're not. There's not obviously an end all scenario, which is like comet coming to earth. You got to get it out in the next two days before we're all dead. There's nothing like that, which I know we're like fourth quarter people. We would just be able to solve it or try and find a way to, you know, everyone unite together to be able to fix that. But at this position, I mean, whether it's in the independent research and all this pressure for oneself, sure. But there's also more of a focus towards putting the reliance in technology to be able to come up with the answer for us as well too like talking to someone a friend of mine who studies dark matter and using things to be able to recreate the big bang just putting it in a probability simulator over and over and over and over and over again you're using technology to feed it data to be able to recreate and see if you can get the recreation of the big bang which they haven't been able to do yet well no one's been able to figure out what dark matter is or even if it exists yeah even it seems it likely but that's a big question but we probably could handle the comet problem fairly well because then everyone would get serious and use all of our best technology and means to do it. But humans are 
failing to deal with climate change. There's massive amount of evidence that climate change is a really serious problem and that's going to make human life worse and worse and worse over the next few few years, decades, and centuries. But there are things being done, but they're still fairly small compared to the magnitude of the problem. So that I think that climate change is a clear example of, of uh, failure of human collective intelligence. Do you think they're putting too much reliance into AI to be able to solve the climate change thing as well, too? No, pe people aren't relying on it. Mean, actually, a lot of the things that need to be done are clear. That would basically dramatically reduce fossil fuels. But that would limit people's lives. That would limit companies' profits. So there are lots of things that keep people from doing what needs to be done. So I think climate change is probably the biggest uh, piece of evidence for human collective stupidity. Do you know who Peter Ward is? No. He made a theory called the Medea hypothesis. Was it the Medea hypothesis? I think it was the Medea hypothesis. I don't know if you've ever heard that before, but it was like the human kinds of inherently suicidal as an aspect of basically destroying itself, that the creation and building up of oneself will eventually lead to its own kind of destruction in a sense. No, I don't think that's true. That's that's about as sophisticated as the theory I heard on the radio today. A guy said, "Well, look, we're we're already at Gen Z. Z is the last letter in the alphabet." <laughs> so he was using that as an argument that the human race was coming to an end because there's nothing after Gen Z. No, I don't think that's true. Yeah, because I think, for example, the problem of climate change is 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 actually solvable. There are good suggestions out there to do. It's just that politicians. And people in general just aren't acting and doing what they need to be done. I mean, sometimes the successes are quite good. Look what look what happened with COVID. And three years ago, this was a dramatically new problem, but it took a relatively small time for people to figure out how vaccines can work, how public health measures can work, how um, antivirals can work. And so I take that as a real sign of the success of human intelligence and its capacity to work collectively to solve extremely difficult problems. But you said climate change and you mentioned about solving it but the issue is with politicians and other things well it's not solved then right i mean if it's an easy fix getting people on board and getting politicians on board so does that human emotion human greed and all these things that end up shooting itself in the foot is kind of his hypothesis yeah that part that part yeah is right yes but, but we but climate change could be fixed but we don't know whether it's going to be or not um i don't that's so that's still an open it seems like it's just emotion and all that type of stuff and i i wouldn't call it selfishness but there's a lot of independent people that are making an extreme amount of wealth off of the certain direction that where a lot of people are suffering from and it's like getting those people on board i mean a lot of people that feel this way and want the change obviously don't have the power for it as well too which just makes me understand like what's the fix to get i feel like if humans just talked a little bit and understood one's perspective at least you at least get a little bit of understanding of a person's thing but we're also disconnected because we are sometimes locked into our device a little too much and we kind of can't get empathy from those devices well, lots of people are making lots of money out of fossil fuels, out of oil and gas. And <clears throat> so it's really hard to get those constrained to the extent that needs to happen in order to get climate change under control. So that's psychologists call this motivated reasoning. So we tend to believe things not because of the evidence, but because of what our goals are. And right now, a lot of people's goals are being satisfied by making money out of the oil companies. That's true of politicians too, get their <clears throat> funding from the oil companies. So there's good psychological explanations for why we're doing so badly with climate change. Whether those can be overcome or not, I simply don't know. Yeah, I mean, it's a, I wouldn't call it a philosophical question, but it's more about like what's inherently good or what's morally right. At this point, it just seems like it's lost a little bit. Well, there's a philosophical question about what's good. I think what's good is what promotes human needs. Uh, so, but but this is a psychological question of how can we get people to act in ways that satisfy human needs rather than satisfy their own particular uh, greed for wealth and power. You know, an awful lot of what goes on at the top levels of powerful governments are greed and power rather than the, the human needs that need to be satisfied. Do you think that? When it comes to, I don't, I wouldn't say the advancement of technology, but when it just comes to the capacity for human intelligence to expand farther from this point on to the next five years, which do you think is probably leading that charge? Do you think it's animals, people, or machines? Well, it's still people because we've still got 
capacity is way more than those. The animals aren't getting any smarter. They're, they're tight, locked in with the biology they've already got. Whereas humans can get smarter because we've got all these wonderful cultural tools where we can develop better ideas. What's the overall trend? Well, geez, some of it's really pretty sad. If you look at a lot of what goes on in social media now. So it's an interesting question whether social media have been good or bad for human bad. development in the last 20 years. I think you're absolutely right because it's made people, especially teenagers, unhappier. But it's also led for the spread of misinformation at a pace was unbelievable before. I mean, it used to be hard to spread information. You'd have to put things out in newspapers or write letters or things like that. Now it's so easy to spread misinformation because if you go on TikTok, you can have 100 million people looking at it right away. And so misinformation spreads way more rapidly than was possible 20 years ago. So I think that's made humans collectively stupider rather than smarter. Do you think that that's just social media, though? Because I've talked to a lot of CNN and Fox correspondents that also talk about that journalistic integrity is basically gone because if they're going to report a story on something and that story could mess with one of their magazine or their news entertainment place that they're working for's business interests or relationships, and they can't report that story or they're going to be out of the career. Journalistic ethics is a giant question where it just wonders how long has that misinformation been spreading around, not just before the era of social media. Well, I think, yeah, but the, 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 the social media have been one of the contributors, contributors to that polarization. I mean, it used to be that most news sources had people who felt at least some commitment to journalistic ethics. And there are still institutions where that's true. Uh, so I've been Canada. We've got the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, which I think is actually very good about this. I mean, they make mistakes occasionally, but I think they have a genuine commitment to getting the facts right. Uh, and they can do this because... They're not profit, so they don't have to worry about whether uh, whether their their audience is going to suddenly switch over. And in the U.S., there's lots of variations. I think there are some sources in the U.S. that are still committed to journalistic ethics, whereas others have gone completely over to saying whatever it is that gets them the audience, that gets them the most advertisers, that makes them the most money. But there still are Good, there's still good journalism in the United States and other countries, but it's getting harder to do because of the increased polarization. There is also a massive amount of them where you can literally pick anything that you wanted that could fit your narrative. I wonder what they're going to do an AI actual news entertainment site. That would be great. I'd love to see a robot version of whoever on the, you know, the TV giving out the news. Well, but here's the problem that – that AI, as it currently exists, things like the large language models, is basically like the most uh, irresponsible reporters that you describe, because it doesn't care about the truth. So ChatGPT has no idea what the truth is, because it has no idea about the world. We is. don't hold weathermen accountable for not telling the truth. They are wrong most of the time. <laughs> well, we certainly hold them accountable for not trying to tell the truth. I mean, Fox News just got held accountable to the level of $770 million. So that was pretty good. Uh, but by and large, uh, uh, but, but, but ChatGP has no idea of accountability, has no values. It has no idea that there's a world out there. So it's actually way worse than the worst current journalists who at least might be able to know that what they're saying is false. <laughs> So that somebody can say, well, we got to say this because we got to look after our base, but at least they know they're getting it wrong, whereas ChatGP has, GPT has no way of, of even understanding what it is to be getting something wrong. So does that make it ChatGPT's fault or just the fault with that it's not just – we can't blame it for not knowing what it didn't know? Well, we can't blame it for anything. It doesn't have any kinds of choice. You can blame People will try. People will try. Oh, that, that's ridiculous. But the programmers have – a real responsibility to make it better. I, you might have seen that recently a thousand people said there should be a moratorium on new work on these large language models until they figure out how to do this right. In principle, you might be able to put computational constraints inside the program so it would care about getting things right about me rather than making up things like I pay for a rock band. Oh, wait, it, does, it makes no difference to it now. It's got no constraints on what it does. And so it's a really interesting social and computational problem to figure about how to make these programs behave in a more responsible way, to actually care about the truth, to care about accuracy, and to care about people. Right now, they don't care about anything. They just predict what's the next word to say. Is that 
I'm mean, something that surprised you or just you kind of expected at the level that we're at right now? Well, first of all, it's important to recognize that this is an advance. There's never been an AI program that could generate so much intelligent utterances as ChatGPT and the other large language models. This, this really was an advance. But if you understand how they work, you'll realize why they can't do anything better because all they are is uh, incredibly powerful statistical engines for predicting the next thing to say. They don't have goals like trying to get things right or doing things for the good of human beings. They can't. So if you realize the way they're programmed, they're basically just trained up neural networks, you can see why they're limited the way they are. Now, when you mentioned you got a new book that you're working on. Did you want to promote your new book as well as the book that you just released in 2021 as well too? Well, I've actually got a couple. <laughs> so, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so so the Bots and Beasts came out in 2021. 2022, I published a book on balance, uh, which was a lot of fun to write because it's both about how the brain manages to balance the body, uh, but also the way we use balance metaphors in our life. This happened a lot during the pandemic. People are saying, how can we balance our lives and our livelihoods? Balance your checkbook. Yeah, yeah. So balance is a, is a great metaphor. So it's both about balance metaphors, but also how our brains have uh, our capacity to keep our balance even when we're walking, but also our consciousness of being balanced. So that's that's the balance book. But of course, what I'm really excited about is the book I just finished, which is on misinformation. So it's very closely tied in with some of the things that uh, we've been talking about, about journalistic responsibility. So I just sent the final version of that off to Columbia University Press, and it'll be out early in 2024. Okay. And when that uh, when it comes out in 2024, I can just go back to this episode as well, too, and then put it in the description so people will be able to click on it when they, whenever they listen to this as well. Um, but I'm going to link all your links in the description, Paul. It's been a pleasure talking with you, man. And thanks, everybody, for listening to this episode of Out of the